Rogers TV, Ottawa. This has certainly been a challenging year for our community. Throughout the coronavirus pandemic, so much has changed in the way we function and how we communicate. But of course, there are still important decisions happening at Ottawa City Hall about the response to the pandemic and much more. So we wanted to provide an opportunity for elected officials to connect directly with their constituents and for you to hear from them. Welcome to Ward Updates, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with Ottawa City Councillors. We will talk about issues arising from the coronavirus pandemic that directly affect you, your families, and your neighbours. We'll share stories of people who have risen to the occasion and are supporting others in this difficult time. And we'll talk about some of the other big decisions that city government is facing in the months ahead. Our guest today is Glenn Gower, the City Councillor for Ward 6, Stittsville. Glenn, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. It's good to see you. How have you been doing throughout this pandemic and, and the people around you as well? How has this affected you and, and what impact has it had on your life and your work? Wow. Um, well, I think like everybody, I'm doing fine under the circumstances. It seems like uh, every few weeks, every few months, we have to learn a new routine and um, and change how we're doing things. Right now, I'm thinking about back to school. I've got uh, two daughters in grade 10 and in, the, in grade 8. And so for our family, it's uh, trying to understand what back to school looks like for them. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've all been working from home on my Stittsville team, and uh, we've been adapting. It's a lot of Zoom meetings and uh, a real change of pace. And, and I'm, you know, I think we're all missing that face-to-face -face human interaction, but we are uh, adapting as well as we can and uh, just trying to do our best to help out residents and connect them with the information and, and solve the problems uh, whenever they're coming to us with, uh, with issues and ideas. What do you think some of the lessons are arising from this pandemic? What are going to be the, the lasting takeaways from this, especially in the context of uh, the, the city's jurisdiction? Yeah, I think it's a, a realization of how, um, how fragile some things are or how close we're, we're operating. Um, you know, we have in the city, city operations, and I think government in general has shown a lot of resilience and a lot of adaptability. But I think we've seen a lot of, of a lot of places where um, I don't know I don't know if hanging by a thread is is maybe too extreme, but you can see where systems are under pressure. I'm thinking of things like um, homeless shelters, for example, and how yes, we were able to adapt and and get people to safer circumstances, but there wasn't a lot of opportunity for error or even something like schools, although that's not part of the you know municipal responsibility. That's provincial. Um, just seeing what the impact, say, of large class sizes has when you all of a sudden have to adapt and and face something different. So I think that's a real lesson, um, understanding that every choice we make with budgeting and resources and how we deliver services, it might work most of the time, but we also have to think about um, how it's gonna work during the worst of circumstances as well. What do you think about the, the discussion around what things are permanently altered going forward and what things will go back to normal? What's, what are some of your observations or expectations around uh, will we all be working from home in the future? Will public transit ridership continue to be low? Or will many of the things that we were used to in 2019 return in 2021 or some date in the future? Yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to do that crystal ball thing, isn't it? I mean, we're still we're still at trying to understand what the impact's going to be. Um, I remember we were having a whole conversation about uh, the official plan and um, what we should consider from the COVID situation when we're planning the next twenty to twenty five years of our of our city. And I really think it's too early to be making those kinds of wholesale decisions. On the other hand, we're seeing at a very direct level, we're already seeing some changes. I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with um, a local home developer, and they were talking about how they're already um, adapting the design of their homes to include like a washing station at the garage door or including hand sanitizer right at the front door. So we're already seeing some little things changes, but I think it's so tough. We're still in the middle of this and we're still really trying to understand what the immediate impacts are and how that might change things going forward. I hope that we're we're paying attention. I mentioned before just 
how we have had to adapt to be resilient. I hope we're paying attention to that. Um, I hope we're paying attention to the impact this has had on local businesses and how they've had to to change. I, I hope people realize, have a better realization now how important local business are, businesses are to our economy in terms of providing jobs, in terms of connecting people in the community. Um, so I, I hope throughout all this, people are at this point really, um, really observing and trying to understand uh, it's too early to say what will happen, but I think it's not too early to start thinking about these things and, and what could change as we as we move on, whether it's returning to normal, or whether it's returning to something new. Let's talk specifically about public transit. Uh, we, of course, have invested billions of dollars in phase one and phase two of light rail. Uh, phase three, if it happens and when it happens, would take it further into the West End, closer to your constituents. What are your thoughts on how all of the what's happened might force us to recalibrate our, and adjust our plans? Do you think, for example, that that uh, there will be a new approach to public transit in the future because of, uh, of what's happened in 2020? Well, I think what we need to remember is all the investments we're making now in public transit are long-term investments. They're not, I mean, they would provide better service in the next one, two, three, four years. Um, but really, these are investments that are intended to keep our city moving forward 20, 25 years and beyond. Um, so I think one thing that's the most important is this is not the time to stop our long-term planning and long-term investment in transit. Um, we've also learned and we've also seen very clearly, this is one of the things I hope people have observed and watched, is that um, the people who are using public transit are oftentimes our frontline workers and the essential workers who have stayed on. So I remember very early on in the pandemic, we would get emails from from some residents who would say, why are you still running the buses if I'm only seeing two or three people on it? Well, it's because this is an essential service. So maybe this is an opportunity to rethink a little bit about what, what transit is, and it really is a service. Um, it really does, um, it's not something you can, you can pull back without impact. And it's also something that we need to think about beyond just um, something that serves the eight to four, the nine to five office worker downtown. It has a much broader public use than that. So if anything, I think we should be ramping up our investment in public transit. Perhaps with more people working from home, it gives us a little bit of a chance to catch up because we already are probably a decade or two beyond where we need to be in terms of our transit system here. So maybe this pause gives us a little bit of a chance to, to catch up to where we should be, but it's certainly not a time to stop investing and growing uh, public transit in Ottawa. We're, we're growing to a million and a half and two million people. And there's just not a, a way that we can keep doing that with, with cars. We need to have a strong, reliable uh, transit service here in Ottawa. Tell me a little bit about how this situation has affected residents of Stittsville in particular and uh, how they've responded as well. What are some of the the acts of kindness, the uh, community initiatives, the leadership, uh, what are some examples of that that you've witnessed? Yeah, I, I think uh, overall, I think we've been very lucky in Stittsville. Uh, we're fortunate to be a, a community where, um, you know, many people are have continued to be able to work. Um, I think sometimes it's easy to forget that there are still a lot of people within Stitzel and with Ottawa, within Ottawa who, who are having difficulties. And I've been really pleased to see uh, people giving back. I remember early on, there were residents going out and, and buying gift certificates for local restaurants because they wanted to help keep them afloat. Uh, I know we've had an outpouring of support for the food bank in our community as well. And there's also been a lot happening to... Um, encourage just good community spirit, good relations between neighbors. Very early on, some residents took it upon themselves to start painting uh, painting rocks, little little stones, um, and putting these along pathways in the community. Something for kids to explore. Just just a moment of 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 delight and a moment of happiness. So little things like that to uh, to keep the spirits up. And we've seen um, so many um, so many instances of neighbors helping neighbors, of, of people starting uh, initiatives to help with volunteering. And that's something that I hope is going to continue uh, even well beyond this pandemic as well. We're, we're starting to build these new connections and these new links in the community that weren't there before and they're going to be there uh, now going forward as well. We're moving into a new phase, obviously, one in which kids are back at school, some people are back at work, the temperature's getting cooler, which means some of the outdoor activities that uh, were at a safe distance might have to move inside. So what are some of the things that you'll be watching for in the fall as, as we take a look at, at this new chapter uh, in the coronavirus pandemic? 
I think we're all watching for um, for how the schools, uh, for how the back to school goes. Um, that's probably the, the, the biggest large scale change that uh, we've seen throughout all of this. I think I'm going to be watching for employers and, and how they approach uh, the back to work. I think we're all going to be listening to Ottawa Public Health throughout all of this. They have been you know, providing excellent guidance and advice. Um, you know, one thing they that Dr. Etches and her team keep saying is is how important it is to uh, to support each other, how important it is to to start to return to work and return to normal things to support the economic health of our community when it comes to school to help the the mental health and the social health of our kids. So. Um, we're, we're listening to the community and trying to understand where, where people have concerns and making sure that we have the resources available to address that as we go into the fall. All right. Obviously, this has had a huge impact on the city's finances. We've talked about transit already. Ridership is down. Uh, transit revenue is way down, which has an impact on the city budget. The shortfall that was identified uh, was about $192 million dollars. Some of that is going to be covered by provincial and federal government funding and support. What about the rest of it? Are we going to see cuts in 2021? Are we going to see big tax increases? Because the city, of course, can't run a deficit. What's going to be the solution? Yeah, uh, well, you're right. It was We did get some good news uh, earlier in August about uh, some money coming through from the federal and provincial governments. It uh, makes up a lot of the shortfall, but not out of it. Not all of it, pardon me. Um, we are going to have a budget, um, a city budget for 2021 coming out this fall, and uh, there may be some tough decisions to make. I know, um, you know, there may be some capital projects, some construction, some new infrastructure that might have to be delayed. We do have some reserves that we can uh, tap into, um, but that's not something that we can do year after year. It's a, a temporary thing, and, and there's always an impact down the line. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but this the city we can't run a deficit like other levels of government can do. And we have a very limited uh, options in terms of uh, income. Uh, we can't charge a sales tax, for example. We're limited to property taxes. So any decision we make about what to spend has a direct impact on a property tax bill. And, and everybody pays that, whether you're a homeowner or a renter. And I think all of us at City Hall are very cognizant of that. Uh, there's a lot of people who are, are struggling in the community. And I think the last thing we want to see is a tax increase. So uh, we need to uh, be, we need to be creative about how we how we defer, how we change, how we alter programs. Also recognizing that um, the the city has core services that cannot be cut back. Things like garbage, things like water, things like transit. And so uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, cutting back on the core is not an option. So we need to look at. Uh, what is there around the edges that uh, could be done differently, could be done in a later year? And uh, we'll keep on pushing the provincial and the federal government, who have a lot of different options in terms of, of revenue and what they can pass on to municipalities to help us catch up on that shortfall. Before the coronavirus pandemic, before any of us knew this was happening, the mayor promised uh, a cap on tax increases in the city over the four year period of this council uh, to uh, at 3%. Do you think you can stick to that? And would you, are you committed to sticking to that? I think it's a good starting point, but again, I, I think we have to understand uh, what the consequences or what the impact of that is. Um, if there's a, a good reason, a justifiable reason in order to deliver the level of service that people need uh, to make sure that we're in a solid financial position going forward to future years, I think it's something that, that could be considered, but as a starting point for a target for, a, for an increase, I think that's a wise target to stick with. Is the nature of city government changing as a result of this in any way, uh, whether it's the, the, the responsibilities the city has, the areas that it works in, or even if it's just the way you and other representatives of the city, elected officials and staff, and the people who work in the bureaucracy at City Hall, uh, how all of you interact with the community? Uh, I think it has. We saw right away, for example, a massive shift of resources and attention to the social services focus of the city. Um, it's always been there, and, and often they work a little bit in the background behind the scenes. That's exactly what they're there for, so that when you do have a crisis like this, uh, you can deploy those resources to help people out. So I think that will continue to be uh, a very big focus for the city going forward. Um, in terms of, of how we work, maybe maybe I'll say something that I've really missed at City Hall uh, we are doing committee meetings and we're doing just regular meetings by by teleconference, by Zoom and so on. We really are missing the human interaction. 
the you know running into um, a manager in the cafeteria or speaking with um, speaking with a, a, a policy writer in a committee room. It, it, it's an interaction I think we've really missed out on, and I can feel it. Um, I can feel what we've lost out on as we go into this fall. Very difficult to replicate with uh, video conferencing. Um, you, you just miss that background information, that casual sharing of information, building the personal rapport and relationships. Last week, we had a meeting of the Ottawa Public Health Board. We had an in-person meeting. We were, we were spread out. We were wearing masks and so on. But I, I saw right away the value of those kind of side conversations and moving ideas forward and, and understanding um, how, we can, how we can work better as a city. So that's something we really need to figure out. Uh, we know that our committees will continue to meet remotely for the foreseeable future. Uh, we know that most city staff uh, are going to be working from home. Uh, we need to continue to make sure we find that opportunity for, for human connection and informal connection so we can keep, uh, keep the city moving forward in a, in a positive way. Before we move on to other topics, uh, is there anything else about the pandemic or the city's response to it or how it's impacted Stittsville that uh, you want to talk about or share? Yeah, I think um, it's something I said last week at the city council meeting. Um, I've been really impressed that uh, staff, in terms of delivering core services or uh, solving resident issues, you know, a pothole needs repaired or, or trees need trimmed or a garbage needs emptied as a park uh, at the park, uh, staff haven't missed a beat on that. And in some cases, I found them even more responsive. And I think there's a, a real sense of um, a sense of mission and a, a really a good uh, spirit of teamwork among city staff. And I hope residents have recognized that as well. I know there's always uh, things that maybe take longer than you'd like or, or seem like they aren't being fixed. But overall, I've been very impressed with the level of service from staff. They've been working reduced hours. Uh, they've got uh, situations at home with families and so on, just like the rest of us do, but they've really uh, gone all in to help out. And it's the spirit that I see all the time here at the city. It's a, it's a good thing. All right, let's come back to light rail for a moment, but from a different angle. And that is, uh, okay. we're here about a year into light rail now, uh, since its launch in September of 2019. And obviously there has been a long list of problems uh, associated with the implementation of phase one. Uh, construction on phase two is underway, as everyone knows. Are you confident that the issues that we've seen, these persistent problems over the course of the first year, can be resolved and that we can have a properly functioning transit system going forward? So I'm confident they can be fixed. Do I have confidence about what date that will happen? No. Uh, we've been receiving regular updates over the summer and, and back into the spring about the uh, technical issues, uh, about the progress. There has been progress. We do have 15 trains running consistently. We've had that through most of the month of August. That's a positive thing. Um, but I still have very little confidence about when we can say uh, this is a this is a reliable system. This is a system that's meeting the public's expectations, and this is a system that's meeting my expectations. And uh, like we were talking before. Having a reliable transit system is, is crucial to make sure our city can function. So who do you hold responsible for what's happened in the last year? Because obviously a lot of the blame has gone to Rideau Transit Group uh, and their affiliated companies. So there's been a change in leadership there. But ultimately, these were decisions that were made by city government and city council uh, and by the mayor as a member of city council. Uh, and uh, and the, the buck has got to stop somewhere, right? So who do you think should be held accountable for what we've been through? <laughs> Everybody? Uh, no, that's the easy answer. Mm -hmm. who's, who's accountable for what's going on? It's, it's layers of accountability. Um, it's something we've talked a lot about, we've been thinking a lot about. Um, ultimately, uh, the accountability lies with the, the elected officials who've made the decisions and continue to make decisions. Um, I think a lot of times we have been very focused on on the minutiae. We've been trying to be transit experts, technical experts ourselves as as counselors and transit commissioners. Um, I think uh, we, we perhaps haven't been asking the right questions in terms of what resources are needed and, and what, what help is needed um, to get this to get this done. Um, I mean, in terms of, of technical ability, as a counselor, I can't go in and, and fix the wheel of a train, um, but we do have a responsibility to make sure that the right personnel, the right contracts are there, um, that the right uh, budget and funding, that the right policy and the right approach is. 
Um, that's a pretty high level answer, Mark. But I think when you're talking about accountability for a government project, ultimately it comes to to the government and to the elected officials who continue to uh, to, to plan, approve, support, and operate these systems. So does that mean then that there, there ought to be some review of all of this? And and because uh, I think the public still has a lot of questions. Maybe we've been distracted from that file by the coronavirus pandemic. But uh, before that, I think the public had a lot of questions about why things were not functioning better. Yeah. Um, and we have already initiated a number of reviews uh, through our own Auditor General. We have third parties who are reviewing technical issues, who are reviewing contract reviews. That's the right thing to do. I think, um, you know, that's another thing I've found over the past year or so is um, um, there seems to be a lot of desire to find blame. Who's responsible? Who should be fired over this? When what we really need to do is, is understand what happened, what are the lessons learned? We're continuing to invest in the transit system. How do we do better last time? So um, there should be every opportunity to uh, to review and to learn from what happened. And not just for a project like, like late rail, but any procurement, any kind of infrastructure that we build, um, we need to keep continually doing better. And there were a lot of things that uh, obviously weren't done right. I don't know if that was intentional. I, I, I wouldn't think so. I don't think anyone's intending to build a poor transit system, but we need to understand what went wrong with the idea of understanding um, what can be what can be fixed going forward. We have very strong leadership in the city who's been you know responsible for the execution of this. Uh, I have every confidence in the city manager in Mr. Manconi, um, but uh, I, I I would think they would agree as well. We need to understand how we do better next time. We've got a third phase of light rail coming in, and we'll have future major projects for the city after that. There's a lot we can learn. Do you think in retrospect, it was a mistake to go with brand new trains rather than a system that had been proven in other communities, particularly communities with a harsh winter like ours? I, I, I wouldn't want to guess on that, Mark. I think um, it's one thing where it's a conundrum of, of being um, in government and public service is that we're always asked to innovate and we're always asked to uh, try new ways. I think part of trying new ways is sometimes they won't work. And again, you, you asked about about uh, investigations or lessons learned. I think it's uh, it's important to understand, um, you know, when you are trying a new system, uh, was it was it planned for properly? Was it uh, executed properly? What can we learn from that? Um, you could have had an issue with um, with any of the trains in the system. We need to understand about what happened rather than double guessing whether it should have been this model or that model. All right, let's talk about growth in the city. Uh, your, your area is one of the fastest growing in Ottawa. There's been a lot of new development in, in uh, residential parts of Stittsville. Um, what's your sense of how we need to manage that properly uh, to make sure that it doesn't create issues around traffic, congestion, and other factors? Yeah, uh, this is something, one of the major things we've been talking about over the pandemic, because we're right in the middle of um, the city's official plan process, which sets out exactly how the city's going to grow. We have a million people living in Ottawa now. Over the next 20 years or so, we're going to get up to one and a half million. One of the um, one of the warnings, I guess, that we got from city staff during this was there is no way that we can continue growing um, and, and have a car-centric approach to our communities. So what the official plan is, is all about is changing that, is uh, making investments in transit, building walkable communities that have not only homes, but all the amenities you need to support that. Um, they're just, it, there's not a way that we can, we can think that we can keep widening roads or building more roads, and that's going to solve traffic or that's going to solve congestion. And maybe that's another lesson of, uh, of COVID with so many people getting out and exploring their neighborhoods and wanting to stay close to home. Maybe that's another way that we can open up that conversation and get some more buy-in for that approach that uh, we need to be living our lives on a more local scale rather than relying on, on getting in a vehicle to get everywhere in our community, no matter whether it's a, an errand that's uh, 500 meters away or, or five kilometers away. On the subject of traffic, and this is related to growth, but there's been uh, a lot of concern expressed about traffic safety. This has been a renewed focus yeah. for the community. Uh, do you support extending the use of uh, a photo radar from school zones where it's, uh, there's a pilot project happening now to other areas as well as a way of, of controlling speed and increasing safety? I do. We do have a pilot project going now with uh, photo radar and school zones. Uh, we get a lot of requests from residents to have uh, photo radar in school zones in our community. 
um, we have uh, a, a real, I think it's a shift we need to start to make in our society and our culture around speed. I think there's too many people who still don't understand or accept that speeding on residential streets puts people in danger. Uh, if a street is signed at 40 and you're going 50 kilometers an hour, that is completely irresponsible and it is putting kids in danger, it's putting adults in danger. And I still don't think that message is getting through. You know, years ago, um, seatbelts weren't something that was common and, and now everybody wears a seatbelt. Um, cell phone use, we're just starting to get to the point where I think where people really understand you can't be driving distracted with a mobile device. Uh, impaired driving, I think by and large people are understanding that you can't drink and drive or drive impaired. I think speed is the next thing. Um, we're making a shift in how we design residential communities in Ottawa so that they're, the roads are designed to keep speeds to 30 kilometers an hour to begin with. Um, we are uh, we're adding traffic calming on older streets to try to retrofit them. Um, we're doing messaging and awareness campaigns to make sure people understand the impact of speed. Um, the other piece of that is the enforcement. And unfortunately, we have too many people who speed in too many streets to be able to uh, deploy police, uh, police cars in a cost-effective way. So photo radar in selected areas like school zones or maybe priority places where you have a lot of older adults who are, are crossing the street where there are collisions, where there are dangerous circumstances, I think it's a great tool to have uh, to enforce that message. We need to slow down on our streets. We only have about 40 seconds left, Glenn, but uh, just a quick thought from you on the debate around ward boundaries going forward. What, what do you think is the best outcome there? Um, we need to have wards that uh, populate, the most important thing is population. Make sure population is distributed evenly. I think, uh, I, I think the general public doesn't care too much about ward boundaries. They don't define themselves by the municipal map. They define themselves on where their kids go to school, where they go for groceries, maybe where they go for swimming lessons. So I think it's much less of an issue than some of my colleagues make it out to be. Okay. Uh, we'll see how that plays out over time. Glenn, thank you so much. I appreciate you joining us today. Best of luck to you and your constituents throughout the fall. Thanks for your time today. Thanks to you and the team for doing this. This is great. Glenn Gower, City Councillor for Ward 6, Stittsville. And that is it for this Ward Update. Thank you for watching.